Then Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There is an interesting pattern found in the circumstances surrounding the tree of life at the beginning of creation compared to its return in the New Jerusalem when all things are made new. At the time of creation, the tree of life was found within the Garden of Eden, a place of absolute perfection, which also allowed man to exist in the literal, physical presence of Yahweh. Entry into the garden and access to the tree of life did come with the expectation of obedience to the instruction of the Most High. In the time before the curse, there was no death or disease. However, after the sin of disobedience, there was judgment and a fiery sword that expelled the sinners from this place of perfection and caused them to forfeit their right to the tree of life whose fruit causes one to live forever. It's not until after the new heaven and the new earth are established that access to the tree of life is once again made available. Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2 Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Scripture records a strikingly similar set of circumstances regarding the presence of the tree of life in the new heaven and the new earth, where, like in the garden before the curse, the residents will be in the literal, physical presence of Yahweh, and there is no death or disease. Similar to the flaming sword which Yahweh placed in the garden to guard the tree of life, scripture foretells of a fiery judgment of the earth for the disobedience of the whole world. There is even a symbolic mention of a sword coming from the mouth of the rider on the white horse, who is the word of God. But perhaps the most important similarity between the Tree of Life and the Garden of Eden and in the New Jerusalem is that having access to its fruit is dependent upon obedience to the instructions of the Most High. Revelation 2, 7 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the Tree of Life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Obviously, as Bible believers, we desperately want the privilege of partaking of the fruit from the tree of life. In addition, the book of Revelation lists a number of other extraordinary rewards given to those who overcome. In order to properly strive towards these rewards, we need to understand what it means to be one who overcomes. I believe that answer is given in 1 John 5, verses 1-5. through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God?
It is worth taking a moment to unpack this passage in order to fully appreciate each verse and the connections between them. Verse 1 establishes that everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah is considered to be born of God, or in other words, a child of God. And as children, if we truly love our Heavenly Father, then we will also love anyone else who has been born of God, because they are our spiritual siblings. The second verse provides a two-part test to determine if we really do love the children of God. We must both love God and keep His commandments. This is no different than siblings living together who must learn to love and respect one another by obeying the rules of their parents, whom the children both love. It is precisely the obedience to the parents' instructions that ensures unity between the children. Verse 3 then tells us how to actually love God, and again, it's by keeping His commandments, which the Bible states are not burdensome. In the same way that siblings who obey their parents learn to live in unity with one another, the willingness of the child to be obedient is pleasing to the parent. It is a way for the child to express love to the parent who is only trying to keep their children healthy and safe. The Bible is abundantly clear that our Heavenly Father's love language is obedience to His law. If you are interested in learning more about this fact, please consider my video on the topic. Three times in John chapter 14, Yeshua himself confirms the relationship between loving him and keeping the commandments. John 14 verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And again in verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. In verse 4, John refers once again to those who have been born of God and states quite plainly that they overcome the world. He then reveals that the victory which allows them to overcome the world is their faith. It's interesting to note that in the Greek, the words overcome and victory are actually related. The Greek word nika, translated as victory, is the root word that derives nikao, which is translated as overcome. Since John is making a spiritual correlation between the victory achieved by those who overcome, it's fascinating to see a connection between these two words grammatically as well. In fact, nakao can actually mean to conquer or carry off in victory. This is why some Bible versions, like the ESV, translate all the instances of this word in the book of Revelation as conquers rather than overcomes. However, by sometimes translating nakao as overcomes, and at other times rendering it as conquers, it can create some difficulty in seeing the correlation between this definition of those who overcome in 1 John 5 and those who receive all the great rewards in the book of Revelation. This is important to note in order to understand that those who overcome in 1 John 5 and those who conquer in the book of Revelation are, in fact, the same group of people. Finally, in 1 John 5 5, it identifies that those who overcome are those who believe that Yeshua is the Son of God. This subtly relates back to the first verse and creates a sort of scriptural loop. In verse 1, believers who are born of God believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but now in verse 5, those who overcome 
believe that Yeshua is the Son of God. This is significant because if Yeshua is the Son of God, that means he is also born of God. And we are supposed to love whoever has been born of God like we love the Father. And the way we know that we love the children of God is if we love God and obey his commandments. And the way that you love God is by keeping his commandments, which are not burdensome. This is what is expected to truly be considered born of God. And everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. So ultimately, 1 John 5 is teaching that key characteristics of being one who overcomes includes a belief in Yeshua as Messiah and obeying the commandments of God. This same connection is seen in Revelation 2 verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So with the understanding that obeying all the commandments of God is part of being one who overcomes or conquers, let us return to the promise of Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So in order to have access to the tree of life, believers must overcome or conquer the world. And as we've just seen, a key characteristic of being one who overcomes is obeying the commandments of God. Thus, just like in the Garden of Eden, access to the Tree of Life is dependent upon obedience to the instructions of the Most High. In fact, certain translations of Revelation 22.14 make this point quite plainly. For example, the New King James Version states, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the Tree of Life and may enter through the gates into the city. Many other Bible versions, however, render this verse quite differently. Consider again the ESV, which reads, Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the Tree of Life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. At first, this seems quite a surprising difference, and to their credit, the ESV does include a footnote that mentions other manuscripts translate this as do his commandments. However, I believe this comment about the washing of robes is still a reference to keeping the commandments, just a little more cryptically. I believe the context for this can be understood by considering a few other verses. The first being Revelation 3.5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. As discussed earlier, the word translated here as conquers is nakao, which is also translated as overcomes in 1 John 5. And as previously established, Key characteristics of being one who overcomes include a belief in Yeshua as Messiah and obeying the commandments of God. So in Revelation 3.5, we have a clear connection between those who overcome or conquer and white garments or robes. It is also worth considering Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8 in which we see an important symbolic connection with the garments of the resurrected saints. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It is perhaps once again worth taking a few moments to unpack this verse 
in order to more thoroughly explain how I see it connecting to the tree of life and those who wash their robes in order to have access to it. Since Revelation 19.8 identifies the fine linen worn by the saints as their righteous deeds, it seems fair to also associate this same analogy with those who are granted access to the tree of life, especially when considering that those who are given access to the tree of life in Revelation 22.14 earned this right by washing their robes, and the bride of the lamb in Revelation 19.8 is arrayed in fine linen that is described as clean and bright. So the issue then becomes, what are these righteous acts for which people are being so abundantly rewarded? The Bible obviously has much to say about righteousness, but I believe there are a handful of passages which can quickly bring into clear focus that true biblical righteousness is associated with obedience to the law of God. Psalm 119, 142 Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Psalm 119, 160 The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Isaiah 51, 7 Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. Luke 1, verses 5 and 6, in which Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, are both described as being righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh blameless. Because of these verses and several others, I believe the righteous deeds of Revelation 19.8 are to be understood as obedience to the law of God. And if obedience to the law of God is connected to the clean, bright linen that arrays the bride of the Lamb, I believe those who are washing their robes in order to gain access to the tree of life are also keeping the commandments of God, especially since, as mentioned before, other Bible translations specifically state this fact. Tragically, many modern seminaries and pastors have a very negative view of the law of God. The Bible, however, repeatedly celebrates and praises it. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. What greater reward could there be than one day gaining access to the tree of life so that we might live forever in the presence of our Creator? Psalm 11 verse 7 For Yahweh is righteous, He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold His face. If you enjoyed this video, I would greatly appreciate you giving it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing to help me build the audience here and give these videos greater visibility. My goal with Turning to Torah is to encourage all believers to learn to show love to the Father through obedience to His Torah.